you're listening to the SAS Says Podcast. I'm your host, Christy Rocha, also known as SAS. I identify as a woman, a wife, and a mother. That should tell you a lot already. And over the last few years, I've learned the value of talk therapy. I have seen how my inner work not only enhances my own well-being, but also my marriage, my parenting, my relationships. And in fact, you wouldn't be hearing this right now if it weren't for the work I've done. My mission is to debunk the misconceptions and stigmas around what therapy is and who it's for. Let's normalize working on our mental health and seeking help when needed. We've all heard of self-care, self-help, and self-love, but do you often wonder how to actually make it all happen? I do. You'll hear strategy-based conversations with professionals, as well as inspiring and validating stories from women who are just like you and me. Think of this podcast as the weekly therapy sessions you didn't know you needed, with a dash of sass, a lot of vulnerability, and me, relentlessly asking, but how? Hello, hello. All right. So I have got a uh, another round two episode for you today. I'm joined again by Stacy and Marcus Noggle. They originally joined me on episode 81 and they are back to dive deeper. As a reminder, this husband and wife team are high performance health consultants. They utilize potent diet and lifestyle enhancements to help excellence, excellence driven people, aka us, generate the vitality necessary to fuel sustained success in their professional and personal lives without burning out. Their six pillars of health methodology focuses on quick to implement action steps that are easily integrated into busy schedules. They've proven their process through three decades of success, helping thousands of people excel in business, do more of what they love, and establish health-positive family cultures by implementing their high-performance strategies. Okay, so you remember them, you know them, you love them, and what you don't know, perhaps, is that they recently uprooted their lives, took their two boys, and moved to Ecuador. Yes, so much of our conversation talks about what the adjustment period has been like, how the boys are coping, what they've learned so far, why they moved. Um, We also talk about some ninja parenting tips, tricks, and advice for getting our kids to eat a wider variety of foods, expand their palates, their minds, and what it means to instill a legacy of health. Health meaning physical, mental, emotional, and Stacey and Marcus do a great job of sharing with us how well, at the end of the day, they're all connected. So not a second more. Here they are. Hey, Stacy. Hey, Marcus. So good to have you back. How are you guys? We're doing great. It's great to see you again, Christy. I know. I've been looking forward to this. Why don't you guys start by sharing a little bit about where you are and what you're doing right now? Well, we've made a huge life change since we um, spoke to you last year, Christy. We are in a little place called Vilcabamba in Southern Ecuador. And this summer we pulled up roots in the U.S. and moved our family to South America Um, on an open-ended journey to learn Spanish, study the um, health secrets of the people down here. This was uh, studied as a blue zone um, by some Harvard scientists a couple decades ago. And that's a place where people have the highest level of health well into their 90s and even over 100 years old. And so we are down here learning about the superfoods and the health habits that have helped people live such long and healthy lives here so we can share them with our clients. Wow, that is incredible. How long have you been over there now? We've been here just about one month. Wow. So it's been a busy month of organizing visas and finding food and finding finding housing housing and (laughs) All those kind of fun things, which have been great. And we've also, uh, we're also homeschooling our kids now. We were very blessed to have them in person school through all of COVID. And now that COVID is more or less over, we're, we are homeschooling our kids remotely. <laughs> so that's a little ironic. Wow. Okay. So 
just in the last month, I can't imagine how, I don't know, the roller coaster of emotions, but how have the two of you been coping? Has it been easier than you expected, harder than you expected? I don't know. What, how's it been? You know, we're, we're veterans of world travel and have lived in different countries over the last 30 years. So I think that our expectations were um, pretty right on. And it's always challenging when you undertake a big adventure like this, especially with a family of four. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a lot of strategies in place to help support us through situations like this. You know, whether you move your family to another continent and country and culture, or whether you have a business where you're going to up level and take a big, bold new step, or whether you start a new project or you decide that you're going to, you know, just jump in 100% and get your health up to where you want it to be. All those are transitions that require some adaptability and resilience. And if you have the tools like we've developed for maintaining our health and our well being and our energy, and we know how to establish new patterns, um, the ones that are most important to support us. You know, when, you, when you've done it before and you have these things in your back pocket and you use them, it makes a stressful, challenging, and exciting situation as easy as it can be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have thought of it th this way, but yeah, it makes a lot of sense because even just, you know, me over here in New Jersey, if I am not, if I wake up and I'm having a day where I'm not physically feeling well, it affects my whole day. And so I can imagine on a much larger scale, uprooting your life, uprooting your family, if your physical health and your physical um, energy are where you're accustomed to them being based on the strategies that you guys have in place, which we're going to get into. Yeah, I can see how much more easily you would adapt more fluid and I don't know. It's just life is better when you feel good, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you couldn't be more right on. And, you know, when you're getting good sleep and when you're hydrated mm -hmm. and when you have, a, you know, a varied diet and we would advocate a broad range of fruits and vegetables that build good gut bacteria, which is the foundation literally of your health and well-being. When you feel good about yourself, we're more, more available for each other in our relationship. We're more available for our clients and our business. We're more available for our kids in school and learning Spanish and trying to navigate the market and learning about new fruits like cherimoya and all kinds of fun things that we're finding out about down here. And when you feel good, you play good. And when you play good, you win, right? <laughs> um, and, if you don't, and the converse is, is equally as true. And so um, waking up and being eager to be in your day and feeling good and comfortable in your skin and ready to take a big bite out of life's experiences, you know, probably a better way of going through life than, than the alternative, right? Totally. How are the kids doing? You know, they are so adaptable and they are, they're adventurous souls mm -hmm. and they have made heaps of friends. They've been playing soccer nearly every day down at the <laughs> local soccer field where, you know, kids go and hang out in the afternoon. Um, they're working on their Spanish. They aren't afraid to try new phrases and speak to native Spanish speakers. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, they love it. They yeah. love it. I think that they would love just about anything. They're just adventurous souls. And we appreciate that. <laughs> That's awesome. And, I, and I'm sure they're feeding off of your adventurous energy between the two of you. They see their parents loving life and, and willing to try new things. And I think that that is probably the biggest, um, I don't know, I guess the biggest influence, the biggest factor on how a kid is going to adapt to a situation. Yeah, I think that that's true. And thank you for reflecting that for sure. I think the other part of it as well, and we're, we're blessed to be moving from a place in the United States that was a small island with six or 7,000 people in a place that in the decades that we lived there, I never locked my house. I never locked my car. And you know, you when you want to get something done, you go to the post office or you go to the grocery store and inevitably you see the person that you need to, you know, conduct your business with and mm -hmm. Pueblo here is about 
five or six or seven thousand people too. And and the boys really have freedom in a way that um, is super empowering for them. And I think that when we uh, take on new experiences that empower us, we we learn about we learn so much more about ourselves. But we also feel so much better at an emotional level, at an intellectual level, which in turn is all connected to our physical level, too. And and so to go back to, you know, how do we want to feel when we wake up in our morning time? Um, you know, if we're emotionally ready to go, if we're intellectually engaged and curious about what's happening next and we're physically tanked up and fueled up and energized, um, you know, that's a really good, sweet space to be in in order to kind of maximize the opportunities that are going to be presented and also to face the challenges that are going to be presented throughout the day as well. And so I think that being empowered through freedom for the boys has really been um, an important part of their experience as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm like, I don't even know what your boys look like, but I'm just picturing these just little blonde babies running around playing soccer. Like it's such a nice image. You pretty much hit the nail on the head <laughs> with long blonde hair. Uh, <laughs> long and <was> short. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so sweet. Um, all right. So, so let's get into it. Let's get into, you know, name a couple and, and tell us about some of the, the strategies that you've developed to, that have helped you and of course your clients and, and your business and everything that's to, with this transition, the, the strategies that you have taken from, you know, your experience and put into place. Well, you know, um, just our conversation about settling in here in Ecuador has brought some different ideas up. And, you know, I think about our morning and how the, we help give the boys a strong foundation so that they feel secure and uh, capable of heading out into a day that has some things that are familiar, but some unknowns they may have to navigate. And, you know, we start out our mornings um, pretty consistently, you know, we, we all want to wake up and, and not feel like we're already underwater. We want to wake up and have some wins in the morning that set us up mentally to feel better about our day. And, you know, oftentimes we know what we're going to, or have a general idea, at least what we're going to have for breakfast. And, you know, maybe we put out the oatmeal or we set the platinos out because we're going to cook those up. And, you know, we've got our tea and we have our coffee, like we have things set up for morning. And so when the boys get up, they consistently have this morning routine with us where, you know, they get up, they make their beds, they get dressed, they come in. We have our breakfast, which, um, you know, Marcus, bless his heart, is often the breakfast person. And <laughs> he's in his mind, I mean, he knows what's going to set us all off to a good start. Mm -hmm. You know, we're always going to have a breakfast that has a balanced protein. We're always going to have some fresh fruit in our breakfast. It's going to be high fiber. You know, it's going to have some good fats in it. All those things that are going to set us up for the best day. So one of the ways we do it, we help our family succeed and our clients is by setting up these routines that we can rely on. Because if we wake up and we're like, oh, chimney Christmas, what's for breakfast? And I don't know where this is. And oh, darn, we're out of milk and blah, you know, all of that. <laughs> My house. <laughs> we're day. It, it, it creates challenges and we'd rather save our energy for solving problems for problems that matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, setting that up and moving to Ecuador, you know, we, we have to start from scratch with our kitchen. Mm. And so in terms of being able to help clients, we, we have taken it down to ground zero and <laughs> just we are building it up um, in a way that will serve us. So that's one of the ways is winning the morning. Winning the morning. Was it yeah. hard to go ahead? Go ahead. I was just going to elaborate just quickly in that I think what Stacy says is really true, winning the morning, and I don't like war metaphors and the rest of it, but to win the war, you they say you need to win little individual battles. Mm -hmm. And so like she said, if you get up and you have a glass of water first thing in the morning, you know, I've already won a little battle and taken a big step towards making sure I've got proper hydration for the day. 
And if I eat a varied breakfast, like Stacy said, and especially one that I haven't eaten yesterday or the day before the day before, and we really try to eat varied food, we don't eat the same thing every breakfast. We have, you know, probably 14 or 15 or 16, and we make up some new ones every now and again, breakfasts that we kind of rotate through. And we certainly have favorites that the boys like, but we always make sure that we have balanced nutrition, balanced fruits and vegetables and fiber and protein within that breakfast. But we also like, you know, one of our little secrets is if you can sneak a few vegetables in in breakfast, mm -hmm. just like that glass of water that you have first thing in the morning, if you can have a few vegetables at breakfast, well, you're so much further ahead. Mm -hmm. And we oftentimes, you know, the boys, we might like to have some multigrain uh, bread of some type and with, maybe with some vegan cream cheese on it with some sprouts. And we usually have grown all of our sprouts and they might be broccoli sprouts or alfalfa sprouts. Um, with some sliced tomatoes and maybe some fresh basil or maybe some hummus. And we've already gotten some vegetables into our diet, two or three different vegetables. We might have a liquado along with it, a smoothie, and which might have four or five different fruits in it. And before, you know, 8.30, we've already had almost 10 different fruits and vegetables. We've already had some hydration. We've already, you know, celebrated our gut bacteria. And another thing that Stacy brought up that, that we do do every day that, you know, I was a management consultant in Manhattan about 30 years ago. Um, and I worked with a managing director who gave me this little tip that I use in everything still. And she said, don't, at the end of your day, leave one project, you know, obviously one that's not due, but leave one project slightly undone that you know when you come in your office first thing tomorrow morning, in five or 10 minutes, you can finish it. So you, you're, you're leaving one task, you know, if you had nine things that you needed to do, I'm going to do eight of them, but I'm going to leave that ninth one for tomorrow morning, even though I could get it done, I'm going to leave it for tomorrow morning because it's an easy task. I purposely picked the easiest thing that's not going to take very much time. And straight away, as soon as I get into the office and I get myself settled in five or 10 minutes, I've already crossed something off my list of things to do. Mm -hmm. I already feel successful in my day. I've already won. I've already had a small win in this greater thing called my day. Mm -hmm. And like Stacy said, we'll oftentimes, you know, set out all the things that we know we want for breakfast tomorrow for coffee the night before. So when I wake up and we're here in a new country where the dogs and the roosters have no idea what daybreak <laughs> means. So they just bark and crow all night long. So it's a very different thing to get used to sleeping where on our island, we would occasionally get woken up by whales and owls. And, you know, it was a very different relationship with noise right. in countries in Latin America. And so, you know, I don't always wake up totally rested. But if I know I could push one button and coffee's going, tea's going, and I push another button and we've already kind of moved towards platinos or we've moved towards, you know, whatever the thing is that we're making, I already feel successful in my day. And while I might not feel totally physically energized yet, at an emotional and an intellectual level, I feel like I'm making progress in my day. And overall, I feel much better. And so little things like that can really go a long way because if your morning starts off in the right way, whatever the right way is for you and your pattern and what you're trying to accomplish, it really sets the tone for the rest of your day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so a, a couple of questions I jotted down just on a very tangible level here. About how long is this morning routine and what time are you waking up? Well, we usually wake up at daybreak. And here, I was going to say, yeah, you, yeah, you mentioned the roosters. <laughs> yeah. And so I think here in Ecuador, we probably, you know, it, it, not, you know, it's usually light at about six and dark at about six again, because we're right at the equator. And so we're kind of up around six. Um, the boys usually go to bed around 8 or 8.30. We usually read together in bed for a half an hour be before, uh, you know, we kind of put them to sleep. Mm -hmm. um, and they usually wake up at around 7. And our breakfast time or our morning routine together usually lasts from around 7 to 8. Okay. They historically have needed to be in school by 8.30. Um, and we only lived a mile from our school when we were on the island, but we've kind of maintained uh, you know, some of that timing so that there's a familiarity for the boys mm -hmm. um, and, and an ease to the process. And so we, you know, I usually make breakfast. Stacy does sometimes. We share the cooking responsibilities, but I tend to do a little more of the breakfast. 
And we usually quiz the boys for their spelling words for their week during breakfast and <laughs> you know, talk about the things that we need to accomplish for the day. We, we always share with them the types of interviews that we're doing and the wonderful people like yourself that we're talking to <laughs> and what we're talking about and ask them if they have any suggestions too, because we really like to involve them um, and what they're doing. And they oftentimes have some super ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and so anyway, we're probably, you know, while we're up at six, we're really kind of starting our family routine at around seven. Okay. And so okay. that six to seven time frame for us can mean all kinds of things. Laundry, um, <laughs> perhaps a little bit of yoga, uh, you know, some connected time together. It just really all depends on the day. Okay. Okay. And um, remind me, how old are your boys? Eight and 11. Okay. Um, okay. And then the other thing I wanted to ask you as, as you were talking, you know, by the time 830 comes, you've had sometimes 15, 16 different fruits and vegetables. Was it hard adjusting to where you were finding food for that morning now being where you are? Like, are you, are you going to a market? Are you growing it? Like, I, I mean, I can't imagine how much you would have been able to grow in a month. So what, what was that transition like? <laughs> Oh, Christy, oh, no. <laughs> food in a new Pueblo and it's, and it's different. Some of the other places we've been in, in Ecuador and through Central America, like there's, there's a market, a fresh food market where there's produce, there's a ton of vendors, you go in, you load up, you come home. Um, but in this particular place, it's not so much that way. So it took a while of walking around town, going into every little tienda, and finding out what they had, talking to people, finding out who has the organic produce that's really organic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when does the produce truck come into town? It comes on Wednesday. That's when you get the freshest oh, food. Um, who has the ripe um, avocados? And, you know, so yeah, it was, it was, took a couple of weeks of walking around town and poking our noses into every little place <laughs> and finding out what we could get here and what we couldn't. Because you know there are, are things that we're accustomed to cooking with and really enjoy that aren't available. Yeah. Um, so we've had to make some adjustments and try old recipes with some new twists. Um, but it definitely took a couple of hours. And we do go to town or you know, walk into the Pueblo every day or two to load up on fresh things. Yeah. And yeah. I don't think that's just us, that's more a pattern, I yeah. think, in dare I say developing countries, but it's also a pattern in Europe where you, you the, the pattern of food acquisition and eating was one such that you walked down to the bakery in the morning time at 7 a.m. and you got your fresh bread for the day because the baker's already been up since four making bread. And you went to your, you know, your local vendors that oftentimes were in the central square, which was by the church. And that was the collective commons area that people would go and acquire the things that they needed for their day. And they didn't necessarily go to a big grocery store where they purchased a lot of highly processed foods that might last for, you know, a week or two weeks or dare say a month on the shelf or, you know, with the refrigerator. Lots of people here don't even have a refrigerator. And so they're literally going from day to day. And in the morning time, they buy the things that they need for the day for as they see how they're going to create their meals. And they do that every morning. And it's a social aspect. You know, Stacy mentioned kind of the blue zone. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's these seven areas that are now five actually on the planet where people habitually live with a very high quality of life over 100 years of age. And not only have they found that they basically eat meat about five times a month, which means that they're primarily eating it's okay. plant, yeah, plants and fruits and vegetables, lots of grains, lots of beans. But outside of the dietary part of it, which is a foundation of our health and well-being, they find that these people are in community. They're seeing their neighbors. They're seeing their family every day. They're not seeing their family, you know, who might live all the way across. Like my family, when we lived on the West Coast, lived on the East Coast. So we would come to the east coast of the United States and drive 4,500 miles so I could see my family in New Jersey where you live. And we could see our family in North Carolina and Boston and Connecticut and Ohio and Pennsylvania. And so it's a very different thing to see your family for one month out of the year to then, than to see them every single day and to mm -hmm. see friends every single day and to commune around 
acquiring your food, acquiring your breads, and planning your meals for that day, that morning. And so it's a very different pattern than we often have in the United States where, you know, for many people, and I can remember when I was super busy, you know, Saturday or Sunday night actually would come and you go to the grocery store and you load up on all the things that you need for the week. And that's the one time you go to the grocery. Right. Right. So, okay. So I know we touched on this last time we spoke, but I think I think there's a, a probably more to say on it. T- everything you just said, okay, we have these blue zones. Part of the reason why a place would be a blue zone is because of diet, community. You know, I, I can totally see how when you're going to a market every day and getting fresh food and having that interaction, I mean, it's so it's so far from what we do here in the U.S., how do we, how do we bridge the gap? Like if you guys were to move back to the U S next week, what part of your routine in Ecuador would you take back with you and make work in the U S you know what I'm That's asking? A good you? Question. <laughs> really good question. Um, you know, um, we've said this in our previous interview and Marcus has mentioned it today. Um, you know, one of our primary focuses with our food and our lifestyle is that we promote a a strong digestive system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we do that through eating a wide variety of foods. We do that through eating a lot of fiber, um, hydrating well, having um, steady daily rhythms and patterns. And, you know, down down here, gosh, um, what would we take back? You know, it's, we're, we are doing things similarly to what we did in the United States. We've been blessed with some different foods here. Mm. So we would search out some of these different foods. One, there are some superfoods down here. One Marcus mentioned, um, cherimoya, which is a fruit that is a very nutrient dense, highly flavored fruit that we're unfamiliar with that we just tried the other day and are looking forward to having a smoothie with it. Um, Lupini beans, lupin beans are very high protein, high fiber bean and they're common here. You can find them cooked in in a little bag at the market, they call them chochos. Um, Chia seeds and quinoa are common plants, um, foods here, and we're eating more of those. So um, I think that we would take um, with us some of these foods that were not a bigger part of our diet in the U.S., and we would emphasize those. Marcus, what else would we do? I think, you know, to elaborate again on what Stacy said, in this Blue Zone diet where they looked at you know, what What were the key success factors, which is my terminology, for why they were living so long with, so, with such a high quality of life. When they scientifically got deeper into it and got past, well, you know, they have a good diet, you know, there generally is clean air and clean water, the people exercise and they commune, but let's look a little level, a little level deeper. And what they found that within these individuals, you know, Okinawa, Japan is one of the blue zones. There's one in Greece, there's one in Italy, there's one in California, there's one in Costa Rica. And then there's this Vilcabamba, which literally means the Valley of Longevity. And when they looked at the gut bacteria of people in these disparate places around the world, the primary thing that they found was they had extremely diverse, varied and robust gut bacteria. And so it doesn't sound like, you know, kind of a sexy, interesting thing to talk about, (laughs) but it is more and more and more talked about and been studied in literature, especially, you know, acutely within the past five years. And whether it's Harvard, the Harvard Medical System or whether it's the Mayo Clinic, you know, if you got on the Internet right now and Googled, you know, what can I do for my gut bacteria? You're going to get prebiotics and probiotics and you're going to get all kinds of information because more and more and more what they're finding is, you know, the gut literally, at a, at, not literally, but at a metaphoric level is how you are digesting your nutrition. It's how you are digesting your experience of life. Mm-hmm. And if you are in a positive, you know, homeostasis, if your gut bacteria is diverse and varied and working for you, um, the way that you digest life literally at your core 
is going to be much more positive than if your gut bacteria is not serving you and you're not digesting your food and you're not pulling all of that nutrition out. And maybe you have some gas or you have some pain or you have diverticulitis or you know other problems with your gastrointestinal system that oftentimes are caused by your diet. And so, you know, feeding your gut bacteria in a positive way is critically important. And, and when asking, well, what patterns would we take from here back to the United States, when and if we move back to the United States, they'd be the same patterns that we brought here, because the best way to feed and create diverse gut bacteria is to eat across a broad range of fruits and vegetables. And so, you know, what those fruits and vegetables are is important. And we want to make sure that we have all of the vitamins, all of the minerals, enough protein, enough fiber, all represented, which is why we do nutritional profiles of our recipes and the foods that we create. But, you know, I can get proteins from different sources down here that uh, that will substitute nicely for the proteins that it would have gotten in the United States. And so while the foods may be different, the concept or the theory remains the same, eating across a broad range of fruits and vegetables, eating across a rainbow of colors of fruits and vegetables every single day in order to stimulate the best, the best most robust, robust, excuse me, gut bacteria that we can have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. And um, I think it, I think it's, I mean, not that you need me to tell you this, but it sounds very consistent to the two of you. <laughs> it sounds like, okay, you just do what you do everywhere you go. And it, you know, we started this by saying one of the quote unquote things that you do everywhere you go is, you know, winning the morning, setting up the routines. What are there other strategies that you would add to that list? You know, one game that we play with our family is how many different foods we eat every day, <laughs> because they, they've done some great studies uh, that show that if you eat at least 30 different foods every week, that you will promote that diverse gut bacteria that will then um, have positive neurotransmitters. It makes the um, dopamine and the serotonin, those feel-good hormones, and it communicates with your brain to give you um, a stronger, more stable mental emotional basis. And so um, eating a variety of foods helps promote that. So we have our fun little game, as Marcus alluded to, in the, uh, we do in the morning, we do it all day long. It's like, okay, how many different foods are in this meal? And then at the end of the day, it's like, you know, my gosh, if, if we ever have a day where, we, where we've eaten less than 15 different foods, it's surprising, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but we, this morning, for instance, we had oatmeal with apple and walnuts um, for breakfast. So it was a pretty simple breakfast today, simple, quick. We had a bunch of things we had to get done. Um, but before we got on this call with you, we also thought, all right, well, let's let's start dinner. We can just like get that cooking so it can cook and we'll have it for lunch or dinner. So we made a lentil doll. So we've got our lentils, we've got onions, we've got garlic, we have carrots, bell peppers, cauliflower, ginger, yeah. um, all in that. And I don't wow. know if we'll make some naan or we'll just throw on some rice or some quinoa or something like that to go with it. And we've uh, already thought about our 11 o'clock snack because we don't eat so much breakfast, Stacy and I. We snack, we, we eat, we have, uh, we eat later in the morning. Mm -hmm. And so we've got some platanos that we're going to saute. We've got a cherimoya. We've got some pineapple. We've got some fresh mango and fresh bananas with a little bit of orange juice. And we've got ourselves a liquado. And we now have gotten five or six fruits for our day and six or seven, maybe with the platanos as well, um, which, you know, again, we could go into the individual fruits, but now we've got our B vitamins covered. We've got some manganese covered. You know, we've got, again, when you eat across this broad range, we're ensuring that it's like having a multivitamin every single day. <laughs> we're, getting, we're, we're getting, you know, the vitamins and the minerals that we need. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think sometimes we think about, okay, well, I need to get every single vitamin and mineral in every single meal. Well, that's not necessarily true. That's not how the body doesn't, you know, the body doesn't quite work in that way. But by varying up 
You know, I can remember when I worked in New York City, I think on the way to my management consultancy job at about 5.30 in the morning, you know, I stopped at a little bagel stand and I got my bagel and I was at my desk by six with my bagel and my cup of coffee every single day. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't maybe the best way to start my day. Thankfully, I was, you know, 21 or 22. So I had endless amounts of energy anyway, because I wasn't 54 like I am now. Mm-hmm. But you know, when you're when you're eating kind of the same thing or the same two or three things for your meals and lunches and for your dinners, you're not getting your multivitamin every day. And, you know, oftentimes people will come to us and say, well, you eat a restricted diet. Aren't you? Cons-? And your boys have been you know, on a restricted diet, on a vegan diet since they were, since conception. Aren't you concerned that they're missing things in their diet? And my first response almost always is we eat more fruits and vegetables and more foods than anyone else I know. Yeah. Most people that I know are on a restricted diet because they only eat about 10 things. Right. And in fact, if you went and probably picked 10 kids, you know, out of any kindergarten or first grade class in the United States and asked them, what are their 10 favorite foods? They'd probably say spaghetti. They'd probably say chicken fingers. Mm-hmm. They'd probably say mozzarella sticks, maybe broccoli. If you were lucky, they maybe might pizza. say grapes. They definitely would say pizza. You know, and if you look at the nutritional profile of the top 10 things that these kids would say versus what our kids are eating, I would always feed my kids the way we're feeding them. And that's why they're thriving intellectually, physically, emotionally, uh, you know, in new experiences. They've been to four or five countries already and probably 15 or 20 states. They're amazing travelers and they're amazingly adaptable. And I think that's because they have such a strong physical foundation and and hopefully emotionally, too, with our family and our dedication to family. But the point being that, you know, again, and we're going to keep saying this over and over and over again, eating across a broad range of fruits and vegetables um, is a really important thing to do. You know, Michael Pullen, who has written a number of books in the area, high profile bestsellers, says it succinctly by saying, eat good food, not too much mostly vegetables. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much the definition of what the blue zone diet is. They eat meat, you know, five times a month, maybe small portions. They're not eating 12 ounce steaks. They're eating three or four ounces of meat when they eat meat. And oftentimes it's used as a condiment or, or as a, as a flavor additive, as opposed to, you know, I'm going to have this huge steak as the focus of my dinner. Mm-hmm. which oftentimes doesn't leave room then for, you know, all the vegetables, which, you know, again, are very important part of the vitamins and the minerals that we need, that multivitamin that we need to get every day. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's say we have, you know, women listening who have the kids that would rattle off those 10 foods that you mentioned are their kids' favorites and they're having a moment of panic how do we start to incorporate new foods with our kids? Oh, we've been very conscious um, about how we uh, expand our boys' um, palate to appreciate a wide variety of foods. And we have some ninja parenting uh, (laughs) tools for that. And one of them is that you chop things very, very small. Mm. So, you know, if you're having spaghetti, it doesn't just have to be ragu red sauce. It's like you can chop up a bunch of vegetables or you can saute or steam some vegetables and blend them and slip it into the sauce. Yeah. Um, You can, you know, get your kids involved in making a smoothie in the morning. And, you know, maybe it's just bananas and orange juice in the beginning. You know, maybe you add some pineapple, but you can throw in a little bit of spinach. You can put in a little spoonful of chia seeds or flax seeds, you know, just start doing things where you are masking different fruits and vegetables so that their palate sort of subconsciously becomes familiar with them. Mm. And then when they maybe see them, they're a little bigger piece. Uh, the flavor, the taste will be familiar to them. and it, they'll be more accepting. Mm-hmm. And I think too, that one of the things we really focus on in addition to eating across a broad range of fruits and vegetables, if you think about the human tongue, you know, it's designed to taste um, sugar, salt, 
um, <laughs> I have to keep going. Sour. Sour. Bitter. Bitter. And so we have these different flavor zones within our tongue. And we think about within our individual meals too. And we've thought about this with our boys since they were weaned at about, you know, six or eight months or whatever it was. Well, we want them, and, and that was an advantage for us is that I think we started the boys as soon as they got to solid food um, with varying and trying to stimulate all of the different flavor centers of the tongue and also trying to feed them. And this is tough with younger kids, but as they've gotten older and their teeth have come in, you know, we look at textures of food too. Oftentimes I think that when you go to a restaurant or you go to some places, you know, people really like to boil all their vegetables. Well, unless you're drinking the water that goes along with it, you've boiled out half the nutrients mm. and you're left with kind of this mushy, fibrous thing that I don't know. I don't think I would like it. And I love vegetables, <laughs> right? And so mushy broccoli or mushy cauliflower is not anything that I think I would like. Therefore, we certainly would never feed it to our kids. Mm -hmm. But we think about, again, you know, this we call, I, we call them silver bowl salads sometimes. And if we take our meal and cut it up really finely and put it in a silver bowl so that every spoonful, we're getting a little bit of everything that's in the meal, we also try to ensure that there are different textures in there as well, that there's something crunchy and maybe that's a raw vegetable or maybe that's a nut, mm -hmm. that there's something that stimulates the sour side. And off, we, we use a lot of lime and a lot of lemon, which is great because there's there's super plentiful down here. And I don't know, when we left the United States and our island during COVID, I think a lime got, an organic lime got as high as almost two bucks for one lime. And we can get... I don't know what, four dozen limes for $2 down here. So we're blessed in that way and we can use what we have. And that's a great vitamin C source as well. But we always make sure that there's a sour component in the food. Bitter is a little more challenging with kids, but, you know, I can remember with the kids and spicy too, with the kids again, you know, at like eight months, we were serving them, you know, a mild yellow curry. And we've just jacked up the spice over the last three or four or five or eight years to the point where, you know, Nico, our oldest, our 11 year old loves spicy food. He'll, he'll, he eats anything. <laughs> the eight year old mostly eats anything, but he still would tell you if you ask him what he doesn't like, he'd say, ah, I don't like mushrooms. Mm. <laughs> we'd say, well, you've been eating mushrooms since you were one and a half years old. Yeah. But that's because we've cut them up or we've blended them up or we've added them in and we don't necessarily tell him everything that's in it. And we do that in order to expand their palate. And sometimes it's better to expand the palate first before you try to expand the mind and educate them about what they're eating. And that's a whole nother strategy too of you know getting your kids involved in tasting the food and cooking the food and chopping the vegetables. You know, you need to do that in a way that's safe. Obviously, we don't give the three-year-old the big 12-inch chef knife and ask them to cut <laughs> up strawberries or anything like that. But you know, that they are super capable of being involved in the kitchen and being involved in feeding themselves and feeding the family. And that helps them feel like they're a valued member of the family when it comes to food and a valuable contributing member of the family too. You know, I think oftentimes in the way we create life in the United States and certainly the way that I was raised, you know, my mom fed us and it was exclusively my mom, not my dad. My mom and my grandmas fed us until I was 18. And I went off to college and the cafeteria and the, you know, the, the restaurant or whatever fed me until I was 21. And then I was on my own at 21. And I'm like, oh, my God, I don't really know how to cook. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I think that we can take baby steps, pun intended, for, with our kids along the way to have them involved um, in all aspects of food and the acquisition and the shopping side of it. You know, we go to the grocery store in the United States. We go to the market here. And the kids have the things that they like, but we'll challenge them to pick something that they haven't had before that we're now going to experiment with, whether that's a fruit or a vegetable, maybe it's a new kind of cereal or a new kind of grain. And, you know, again, teaching them diversity and teaching them again, you know, a broad experience with food helps them to be, you know, maximally healthy within their physical body. But it also, you know, our lives are all chaotic from time to time. And if you're used to variability and if you're used to a little bit of chaos and that doesn't work you up, that is a step towards learning adaptability and it's a step towards learning resilience that allows you throughout the course of your day, whenever there are inevitably going to be challenges 
for you to deal with them in an open mind and from a foundation of experience that will set you up for maximum amount of success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, I like, and I'm resonating with, you know, kind of expanding the palette before the mind, just mostly because my kids are little four and two and, you know, I'm, my daughter is all about fruit she'll eat any kind of fruit essentially vegetables hit or miss but my son is like your typical toddler like super like american toddler like i don't even want to tell you what he eats but you already know based on my embarrassment and sharing with you but okay one thing the thing that i'm struggling with with him is trying to expose him to more foods and trying to get him to eat more fruits and vegetables. One thing I'm, I'm really just personally internally struggling with, and I wonder if you have thoughts on it is in this sort of, in this period of time where he's not taking to it yet, the waste, the waste just like eats at me. Like I have not tried, you know, super blending or, or super chopping. So I'm going to try these things. I think those are great ideas. Um, but any advice or thoughts on kind of that, that middle ground of time period where I just feel like I'm wasting food in preparing it for him and ultimately he doesn't eat it. Well, you know, first off, you've, you've answered a lot of your question by saying, Hey, I'm, I'm going to chop things small. I'm going to blend it up, um, and serve him tiny little bits. Yeah. You know, he doesn't need a, a whole big amount and like one strawberry, you know, like, is that yeah, rather yeah. than like a serving of, yeah. Okay. Right. And, you know, one, one of the things that we've done and, and, you know, I forget because we, it's so common to us, but we realize that when we make a meal, we rarely have a meal where like, here's your pile of broccoli, here's your pile pile of rice. Mm. Here's, you know, your protein source. We, we don't separate our foods that way. In fact, what we do do, I'm going to interrupt you, Please. is um, we might make, for example, like in their fruit plate for the morning, you know, maybe we're going to make the sun. And so we cut up the mango in thin, small strips. And, you know, those become the radiant, the so radiant, the, the sun oh And gosh, then, you, you know, we so need to <laughs> the blueberries for the eyeball. It may be, you know, a, a banana nose and some strawberry mouth. And it, it's a face on their plate and it sounds stupid. And it really doesn't take that much time because you're like, oh, my God, I'm going to have to be making up all these food animals and whatever else. Yeah. But, you know, when the food looks attractive on the plate or it's something that looks familiar to them or it's something that's fun, you know, you're, you're, again, you're, but you're in their head, right? Yeah. And then now, oh my God, mom just made the coolest, I don't know, <laughs> animal lizard I've ever seen out of kiwis. And they're thinking about lizards. They're not necessarily thinking about kiwis, right? Yeah. And they start to eat. And so, you know, distraction, 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 I think is what teachers and parents use a lot of the times for all kinds of things that we do with kids. And I think you can use the same thing to a certain extent with food as well, where you think, if you think, just a little bit of effort towards the presentation mm -hmm. distracts them enough sometimes from the content that they might take an extra bite or two than they have before. And I think that that I think that food with kids overall, I you know, I'm, we're very empathetic to where you are with your kids. And it's awesome that you've got one that will eat any fruit. That's amazing because a lot of people don't have two kids that eat well at all. Yeah. Right. So you're already, you know, you're your steps ahead of where I think a lot of people might be. But again, it's you need to play the long game, not the short game. And if you mm -hmm. battle them every single meal and if you don't sometimes allow them to win, whatever that win means, giving them the thing that they like and maybe giving it to them in a slightly different way or um, but but think about the long game. Think about the day and the week as opposed to each of the individual meals. Sometimes you can have some more success. And I think. Like you said, you know, waste. I I read a statistic in the United States that during COVID, forty percent of all the fruits and vegetables that were grown were thrown out, which oh is it's astounding. And I don't yeah. know. I can't remember where I read it. It was in a scientific study, and who knows if it was true or not. But to think that the possibility that it could even possibly be true, with all the starving people that we have on the planet as well, was just astounding to me. But then you think about how much food gets thrown out in restaurants 
portion sizes have gotten so big, practically nobody can eat what they serve you in a restaurant if, if you can even afford to go to a restaurant in the United States now. And, you know, there is a lot of waste and, and repackaging that food that was not eaten, you know, assuming that it's in a format and, 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 and it's able to be repackaged, so to speak, by blending it up into sauces or yeah, cutting it up exactly. again, you know, those are, those are great strategies mm -hmm. because I think for us, a, we've gotten, kind of gotten our thing down to a science where we don't have a lot of waste to begin with, but oftentimes we're happy to have that waste or we're happy to have those leftovers because what we try to do then is repurpose them or repackage them in a different way so that we're not having, you know, maybe the vegetables that were left over from the day before, but we've chucked them in a pot with a little bit of vegetable stock and maybe some almond milk, and we've turned them into a soup. And um, then that becomes a way that we repurpose or repackage the leftovers that we had from the day before. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's a strategy that, you know, it takes some time to get there. And I know oftentimes we're super busy and, you know, trying to learn some new strategies and some new tricks can seem daunting at first. But if you just pick one or two of them and start to implement them over time, um, you can you can make some very positive changes and involve your kids in ways that, um, help them be more open towards a broader range of food. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and, and just picking up where you just left off on, you know, it being challenging or time consuming to start new strategies, new tricks, new, new ideas. You know, it's funny because as I listen to you talk, I can hear, you know, just how a part of your regular life it is like oh just you know throw it in a pot with some stock and this and that and and there are many people out there at times myself I like I go through waves of being in, interested in cooking and waves of not and and when I'm into it it's like that seems really simple and then there are times where I'm like whoa like that's not as simple as it sounds but what I'm getting at is that it can it can be that simple like I think I don't know. I think like, I think like many other things, particularly in the U S we, we overcomplicate things. Like we need a recipe or we need a book, a cookbook, or we need to Google something on our phone to figure out how to cook. And it could really be at times just as simple as, Hey, I made this dish for my son. He's refusing it. We're eating mozzarella sticks again. So let me just put this in a pan and see what I can do with it. I, absolutely. I mean, amen, a woman. Um, I think that cooking, like lots of things in life, you know, I'm going to go back to the something that I said before. And, you know, I grew up and all the women cooked for me, my mom, my grandmothers. Um, and then I went to college and everybody else cooked for me. And then all of a sudden I was on my own and I'm like, oh, my God, what, what am I going to do? I don't really know how to cook. Yeah. Um, and I think that all of us have a have a differing relationship with how we feed ourselves and and the ability that we have to do that, which leads to confidence. And I think that, again, getting your kids involved in the kitchen, even if it's just something so simple as tasting what you're making and saying, hey, what do you think it needs? We, we always ask our kids, we play this game. What do you think? What do you think this food needs? And Nico's always going to say it needs more lime. And Ryan's always going to say it needs more salt. And we even have an Italian friend here who has a restaurant who tried out a vegan soup with us. And Ryan tasted it. And the boys said they thought it was delicious. They would eat it for breakfast. But Ryan's like, well, I think it needs a little bit of rosemary. And I think it needs a little bit of black pepper. Well, I would never <laughs> put rosemary and cream of tomato soup. But, you know, he's thinking about it. And he's a part of the process. And, um, you know, all of those efforts, no matter how small or trite they might seem, are ways of giving your kids confidence so that when they do get to a situation where they're more involved with food, they're not afraid to try some things because there's a little bit of a foundation to work with. Yeah. Um, and I, so I think that that confidence of, well, geez, I, I've never made a sauce out of uh you know cauliflower and cauliflower is kind of a cheesy thing to begin with and so maybe that would go well with some nuts and you know i think that i want to go with the central american or mexican theme so i'm going to go throw some cilantro in there as opposed to some basil if i was going the italian direction and those types of things are easier to develop over time if you keep them simple and you don't feel overwhelmed like oh my god i'm gonna pull out this recipe and this recipe has 
15 ingredients in it, mm -hmm. three of which I haven't even heard of and, not are in, and are not in my kitchen anyway. And it tells me that it's 20 minutes prep and 20 minutes cooking, which inevitably means it's 35 minutes of prep and 25 minutes of cooking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not going to be able to get it done in the half an hour I have to feed my kids. Mm -hmm. And so it's certainly been uh, an art for us to be able to open up our fridge and look in our fridge and say, well, geez, I see that there's this thing in there with this thing and that thing. How am I going to put it all into a meal? And we take that as a challenge because we like food, but we certainly, like everybody else, have our days where, you know, we've traveled gone on three plane flights and gotten up at 4 a.m three days in a row and the kids are cranky and we've been with each other for 24 7 for <laughs> seven straight days and nobody's had any break from each other and we're where we're just like i am sick of eating i am yeah. tired of food i'm tired of you i'm tired of all of it <laughs> I, and so we we have those moments too yeah. um we're and you know i think that the nice thing is is when you create patterns and you create habits that are successful for you when you're in those chaos moments when you're in those breakdown moments you have something to fall back on um, and, you know, in those moments, too, we're not afraid when we can afford it and we can afford it much more easily down here than we could in the United States to go out to eat right. <laughs> and have something else cook for us from time to time as well. Right. And and if you have steady, positive habits that support people to express their highest potential, you know, you you've established these things, you know, man, if you if you're having bagels a few days in a row, you know, Fine, <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it's we're not we're not aiming for some crazy food perfection every day. Right. Um, and I want to bring up there there are these four S's, and there was a time when I just had to have food simple, and it was smoothies, soups, sauces, and salads. <laughs> and you know, my gosh, soup is one of those things where when you're down to the end of your produce and you've got a few things left, you can throw it in a soup. Mm -hmm. You know, you can chop it up small. And if you, if you find like three soup recipes this week, go out and find three soup recipes that you think you'd like. Mm -hmm. And you know, those can become your core. Like we have certain meals that are our core that we rotate through. So if I'm going to pinch, it's like, I'm going to do a stir fry because that is such a no brainer, simple chop up what we have, make a little sauce for it. Or, you know, uh, gosh, even if I have a little bottle of teriyaki sauce mm -hmm. and put it on a whole grain, you know, that's just easy. Sauces are godsend. Marcus is our pro pesto maker. <laughs> and we almost always have a jar of pesto in the fridge and that can go on toast. It can go on pasta. It can go in rice. It can go anywhere. Stir fried vegetables. <laughs> um, tahini sauce is one that I love. I could eat it by the spoonful, actually. Um, the boys love teriyaki sauce. So if you have a sauce, you you can put that on almost anything to make it something that you love. And if you talk to your kids and you and you know what their favorite flavors are, um, you know, have sauces on hand so that you can make anything, any food, something that. Uh, you're starting with something they'd like. Yeah. Smoothies, you can throw anything in. Yeah. Um, you know, so find a few, find three smoothie recipes, experiment, find three that you know you like. And then when you have these baseline recipes, you know, you can funk it up depending on what you have or what your mm -hmm. mood is or how adventurous you're feeling, but you mm -hmm. just get these baseline foods to rely on. Um, and you know you've got some things covered, and then you know you can experiment when you're feeling more adventurous, but at least you've got a few things you can always turn to. Yeah, yeah, and thank you for saying that. I really appreciate the, the four the four S's and sort of that that the idea of having the baseline because, you know, I I listen to the two of you and I it's I, I'm I I admire you so much. And I, but there, there's the other side of my brain that also just a lot of why I might not cook sometimes is because I don't want to clean it up. And yeah, yeah. it's like the living. And when I say when I'm connecting it to the two of you is that 
this, you, this is your life. Like you've made, this is your livelihood. This is your purpose in life. This is your passion. And when I say this, I mean, food, health, happiness, all of it. And, and I, um, you know, I've been trying to think of how to ask you essentially, like if food is not uh, someone's purpose in life, but they still want the health part, you know, like yeah. how to, how to bring them together. And I think, I think that the four S's and, and those baseline, that idea of the baseline is, is a really good place to start. Would you add anything to that? I would for sure. And I'm going to go back to the blue zone too. And when they look at the people that live the longest on planet earth right now with the highest quality of life, you know, not only are they eating a conscious plant-based diet predominantly, but the other things that were important in that were exercise and community. Mm -hmm. And I think community, you know, oftentimes we define community as something outside of our house. But the first community that we have and the most important one to each of us are our families, whatever our families are, a partner, a significant other, maybe some kids, maybe not some kids, you know, maybe you're single too and, and your family are the people that live in your building or the, the people that you work with and they would be outside your of your house friends. in those cases or your best mm -hmm. friends. But, you know, I think for us, I think, you know, something that you said, what's really, <laughs> I think about a lot is like, sometimes we go out to eat because I just don't want to deal with cleaning up the dishes. <laughs> I don't want to wash the pans. I don't, I don't want the mess in the house. I know that from start to finish dinner is going to take, you know, X amount of time. And I just, I don't feel like doing that. So, you know, occasionally go out to dinner. But what I would say is, you know, and I'm, I'm really blessed to have a true equal partner and everything that I do with just immense amounts of respect and admiration for Stacy. You know, if she cooks dinner, I usually clean the dishes. If I cook breakfast, she usually cleans the dishes. You know, sometimes I'll cook and do all the dishes too when I know she's tired or having a partner that's supportive and understands where you are in your place in that moment and can support you in a way that's meaningful is critically important. And whether that has to do with food or not with food, whether that's minding the kids laundry. or whether that's laundry or whether that's, you know, trying to make order out of the chaos of the house because you've had a crazy week and nothing's gotten put away and the laundry's still, you know, all over the place. And mm -hmm. Whatever, whatever else it might be, I think that community aspect again. While we off, while, we, while the focus with us or a big focus with us has been getting our kids involved around food, you know, get just just honoring family and celebrating family and trying to put that as high as possible and always thinking about how do we make this a family activity in everything that we do. You know, many hands make light work and a bunch of other cliches that I could bring up, but it's very true. Not only do many hands make light work and make it easier for all of us, but these are shared experiences together in your family that deepen your relationship with each other, that teach me something about or teach us something about our sons to see them in the moment with a bigger knife than they've had before. Then now they're starting <laughs> to cut vegetables. And, you know, what's their relationship with precaution or what's their relationship with risk? Or, you know, I you it's a seeing these moments as an opportunity to learn and grow and deepen our relationships and doing them together in community, I think is a really important part of it. And so we've chosen food, uh, you know, as a big part of our focus for building family mm. and, and building community overall, because it's not that, you know, we're doing that within the walls of our home, but we're also doing that with people like yourself and people all over the world and with the with the uh, peoples that we're living with here in Ecuador who are growing food for us and developing relationships with them. We're always constantly thinking about community and family. And I think when we feel overwhelmed, when we have people that we can lean on that can meet us in the place and honor us where we are, no matter how messy it might be, and can give an encouraging word or be involved even just for a moment in that space with you, it's really a gift and a blessing. Yeah. You know, Marcus, yeah. One, of, one of the things that this reminds me of is that, um, you know, health and, you know, lifestyle, our diet and lifestyle um, affect our health. So, you know, life is health or lack of it. You're adding to it. You're taking from it one or the other just by everything that we do to live. But um, especially with kids, you know, we are looking at the long term, like 
we're building a legacy of health because we all come from family patterns, some good, some bad. And, you know, we instill our children with ways to think about their bodies and their well being and with patterns and strategies. And, you know, so we try to do that with our kids. We want to instill a legacy of health so that we know that when we're done in this world, our kids are taking forward something that um, will support them, that they can pass on, that, you know, we feel really good about. Um, so it's a long game. And something that I was just thinking about for your kid, that um, short game, <laughs> and as well as a long-term habit is, you know, Marcus is brilliant with um, fruits like berries, strawberries and blueberries and raspberries. Um, we, we have in the refrigerator, he'll put them in dishes. So there's a little dish of strawberries, there's a little dish of blueberries, a dish of raspberries, there might be um, a dish of cut up pineapple that's covered. But our youngest will go into the fridge it's just like, hey, there's the food, beautiful, looking me in the face and mm -hmm. grab a handful of it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we don't, there's not a place where he can go and grab potato chips. Right. Um, or, you know, what, whatever else. But when he opens the fridge, what he sees are these brilliant, beautifully colored foods that we want him to eat. <laughs> Ninja parenting, we make front and center the foods that we want him to snack on. He opens the fridge and that's what he snacks on. Yeah. So, you know, for Andy loves it because now he's feeding himself he's as opposed to us feeding him. And it comes back to the empowerment thing. It comes back to confidence in the kitchen. It comes back to, you know, an, uh, an intuition and in, around nutrition. And he's he's now empowered to develop this relationship within himself on his own as opposed to us teaching him. And that's, you know, that's important. We all need the opportunity to be the teacher and the student. But Kids need the opportunity to teach themselves as well and to be empowered and feel like they're in control. Yeah. Hmm. Another thing I was think, oh, thinking of for your kid, um, for your youngest one, is that, you know, food, you can categorize food in a lot of different ways. And so maybe you take them to the store with you, Christy, and you go, okay, we're going to make something with orange foods this week. What orange foods should we try? <laughs> and, you know, let him help pick out some carrots. Maybe he'll pick a bell pepper or, you know, an orange yam. tomato or a yeah, yam or, you know, who knows, but, you know, make it fun and categorize it in different ways. Or you could say, we're going to, let's find out what they eat in Italy mm -hmm. and, you know, talk about that and go, you know, is there anything that sounds good that you want to want to try? Like, you know, maybe we throw some new things in some spaghetti or, you know, I don't know, pick, pick a culture, pick a flavor, pick a color and approach it that way as a creative project where they can go, hey, yeah, let's try this. I've never looked at the bell peppers before because I've always been sitting in the cart. Yeah. Uh, and maybe they'll, maybe they'll say yes and, and try something new. And then again, as Marcus said, they're empowered to make some new choices. Yeah, I think he would, he would like that. He would, he Role would models, get down too. with that. Yeah. 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 Does, he, does he like sports? Does he like superheroes? Oh, yes. Yeah, well, he likes uh, he likes dinosaurs. He likes Paw Patrol. <laughs> he likes all like your typical oh, boy. And that's <laughs> awesome. And, and yeah. so you could go through dinosaurs. Some dinosaurs were herbivores. Some dinosaurs were carnivores. Some were omnivore, right? And so, you know, maybe he's going to be a herbivore today. And he's going to be a brontosaurus <laughs> or a brachiosaurus. And he's going to eat plants today versus yeah. his T-Rex day when he's going to eat all meat or whatever it might be. You know, you can look at pro athletes. There's so much information now, too. And we've really gotten much further in our understanding of nutrition. And we've broken broccoli down into every single little thing that's in broccoli. And I'm not sure that that's a good thing or a bad thing and all these micronutrients. And but you, you can look at what pro athletes eat and, you know, he can and share with him, okay, well, if your favorite football player, your favorite dinosaur ate these things, well, let's try and be this thing or this thing today. And we're going to eat, you know, this new food, or we're going to try a little bit of this. And, and sometimes modeling or seeing other people or other critters or other animals eating the way that you're eating and that are things that you admire and you look up to can be helpful as well. Yeah. Yeah. These are great ideas. Thank you guys. Um, as, as to be expected, I'm feeling inspired. Um, and I, I, I did want to make sure to share with you that from the last time we spoke, as far as my own eating, 
designating an area of the fridge that is mine has helped tremendously. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, well done, you. I know, but it, it's like, it's so crazy. Like, it's so, I don't know, it just boggles my mind that we will go to the store, we'll buy apples and just putting them in a different part of the fridge all of a sudden was like, oh, yeah, let me eat it now. <laughs> nice. Oh, well yeah, no, it was good. It was good. All right. So anyway, is is there anything that I have left out of this this conversation, this this round of of good stuff that we've got here that you want to make sure to get in before we wrap up today? You know, I, I think that Marcus and I could talk for days about <laughs> diet and lifestyle and yeah. you know, how to have that high performance level of health that makes you feel like you can show up with your A game every day. You know, that's yeah. that's our goal is to empower people to do that. And I'm going to bring up one last thing, oh, though. OK, um, and, and I'm thinking in particular about your kids and just, you know, I would call it the ritual of eating. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, you know, let's get outside of the food. Let's get outside of the food habits we have that may or may not serve us. Let's just get into the process of what we do when we eat. And I think one of the things that we try to do is if you're fortunate to have the ability to do it, you know, oftentimes we have a table in our kitchen or maybe in a dining room if we're fortunate enough to have a dining room where we sit down and maybe eat together as a family. First off, we always eat together as a family. We eat every breakfast together, we eat almost every lunch together, and we eat invariably every dinner together. And so that's very different, I think, than, and, and certainly that might change when our kids get older and, you know, they're in different activities after school. But right now with an 11-year-old and an 8-year-old and all, all of us kind of in the thing together in the same way, it's easy to do that. Mm -hmm. But we eat outside as much as we possibly can. And we were blessed to have an orchard. And so we would eat in the orchard and have a picnic when we could. Or we were also blessed to be on a beach. So we'd go down to the beach and eat on the beach when we can. And here we have in Ecuador, a couple of different zones, if you will, in our house where we can go eat and on the lookout and look at the Andes Mountains while we're eating. Or we can eat in the actual kitchen where we've cooked all the food. Or we can eat on the back deck. And so we rotate the places that we eat in order to kind of keep it fun. And it might not sound like what's easier, just rotating the places that you eat. And how is that fun? But what it does for the kids is the kids come to us and say, where are we going to eat? because they help set the table and they help put or the plates candles. out. And then after defining where we're gonna eat and defining what we're gonna eat on, then they help light candles. We don't light candles for every breakfast and every lunch for sure, occasionally we do, but we do for most of our meals. And so they yes. love fire, all kids like fire, right? And if they get to light the candles, man, they're over the moon. <laughs> um, and maybe they're, you know, we listen to music. Um, and so maybe they're gonna select the music and we're not gonna select some, you know, bass heavy reggaeton, what, you know, whatever they're into now, but we're gonna find some appropriate music that helps us be um, peaceful and, you know, feeling good while we eat our meals. So maybe one of them picks the music. Nico, our older one, loves to write. So he's written a couple of blessings and we say, um, his blessing, along with other blessings that we've taken from around the world and from some of our childhoods, too, which help us reconnect with the emotions that we had around eating with our families at a Sunday meal with our grandparents. And so you can broaden the experience of food and broaden the experience of family and highlight the experience of family within the process of eating, even if you're eating mozzarella sticks. Right. And, right. Or even if you're eating whatever it might be, right. even yeah. if you're trying not to eat the leftovers or, you know, that puts you again into maybe perhaps a different mindset. But most importantly, it involves your kids in the process in a way where they can participate um, and feel like they're a part of creating that experience, which again is empowering, which again is liberating. And when they feel empowered and liberating, no matter what role they play in the family and around food, then that will carry over, that mindset will carry over at some point, again, little by little in a long game into um, the experience of food and family being one of positivity, one of pleasure, one of inclusiveness, and one that allows them to perhaps find more security and experiment with new types of foods and experiment with new ways of being in that experience as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. That's really, really smart. 
really good ideas. I really appreciate the two of you. I have two pages of notes. So <laughs> thank you so, so much. I wish you guys all the best in Ecuador and please keep me updated on your travels and your learnings. And I would love to catch up with you guys again and in another couple of months. So thank you so much. Thank you, Christy. And you know, we really appreciate you and we want to provide the most value that we can for the community of people that you have drawn together who are all looking for ways to enhance their life experience. And we have a gift for you and a gift for your listeners. And we, you know, as Marcus just brought up, you know, the idea of eating in different places and setting up um the environment for your meal as a way to enhance your well-being and your health. Mm -hmm. um, we, we do what's called a high-performance health audit for people. And in that, we do an interview with someone, find out sort of what their health is like and what their goals are. And then we put our, our problem-solving minds and, and we think about what is like the one keystone thing for you. Um, one thing that you did was you designated an area of the refrigerator for yourself. Mm -hmm. And that made a difference and it ripples out and it continues to make a difference. Um, but it wasn't a hard thing to do, but it's making a change in your life. So we look for like, what is a keystone thing that if they just did this one thing, it would have the biggest return on investment, mm -hmm. minimal effort, biggest return. That's what we're always going for. We don't like to struggle if we don't have to. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we come up with what that is, and then we give them a one week challenge to do that thing every single day. And we are accountability buddies that whole week. And then we do a follow up call. We go, how did it go? What can we do? How can we help you build on this momentum and keep it going forward? So all of that, that whole nine days is a high performance health audit. And we want to give you and your listeners a $50 off coupon. And the coupon code for that is really easy to remember because it's SAS, S-A-S-S. -S. <laughs> um, so if you provide the link, I'll make sure that you get it. Um, anybody can get on our schedule and get an audit and we can look for those ways to enhance their life, their well-being, their health, build their family legacy of health, whatever it is that they want to do in the most efficient, effective way possible to save time and energy instead of feel like you're in putting more of that out. We want to help, help people be efficient and get what they want with less effort. That is incredible. Thank you guys so much. I will, of course, link it in the show notes. And I mean, I don't know who wouldn't want all the things you just said. So um, I, and I'll talk about it again in the outro, but yes, that is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I You're am welcome. so excited to check that out. And uh, again, just, just thank you guys so much for not only talking with me, but everything you're doing out in the world and, and sharing everything you're learning with us. It's really incredible. It takes a conscious community and we're super blessed to be a part of yours. So thank you so much and keep going. Thank you. All right. As to be expected, I came away with so many great new ideas. I absolutely love the idea of taking my son to the grocery store and having him pick foods that he wants to try based on the color. I get the emails every week from his school where they're sharing what color they're focusing on that week. And I think I could tie something in with that. They also share that, I don't know if it's by week or month, but they learn about a different state and different country. And anyway, I think having him choose foods based on one of those categories would be really fun for him. I also love the four S's, smoothies, soups, salads, and sauces. Simple, to the point, and it feels super manageable, right? So that was that's the thing with Stacy and Marcus is that their life to me, I it's like I put it on a pedestal and I want to take what I can from it <laughs> and implement it into mine. And going to the grocery store, picking foods based on color, sticking to the four S's, winning the morning, like those are things that I think I can do. And speaking of winning the morning, my town mommy Facebook group 
within the last two weeks started a morning accountability group chat and I joined it and it's basically just a bunch of women supporting each other trying to get up earlier and it's helping me get my butt out of bed and it so you know things happen when they're supposed to anyway last but certainly not least do not forget to check out the show notes for the link and details to the offer that Stacy and Marcus is giving are giving uh, all of us the listeners for their high performance health audit there's $50 off coupon for you they're awesome you are awesome thank you for listening thank you Stacy Marcus Keep us updated on life in Ecuador, and I will catch you next time. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in today. SAS Says is a production of Luann Nigara, Inc. This podcast is meant to be educational and not meant to replace professional therapy or professional medical attention. To learn more about today's show and what's new in my world, head over to sassays.com. Thanks so much. Talk later. Talk later.